In today's show, season previews for Malcolm Brogdon and Robert Williams. What are they going to bring to the Trailblazers and how long are they going to stick around? Welcome to Locked On Blazers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Trailblazers, your daily Portland Trailblazers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, world? It's your past first point guard and trailblazers reporter, Mike Richmond. You are listening to another episode of Locked On Blazers, part of Locked On Podcast Network, available wherever you get podcasts and also on YouTube. Thanks for making the show your first listen. Coming at you Monday through Friday, every single weekday. So make it a part of your daily routine. Tell your friends to do the same. Locked On Blazers, your team every day. Today's show, continuing our season preview series. This is the sixth installment of our third annual Lockdown Blazers countdown to tip off. Going to run through every player on the roster, give you a brief but thorough look at what they'll bring to the team. We'll look back to look forward to begin with recapping their season last year, how they got to the Blazers. We'll talk best and worst case scenarios as well as expectations and role. We're talking Shamrock Shakes today, looking at all things Robert Williams and Malcolm Brogdon. That's the Shamrock Shake-Ups, actually, was the joke there that I missed. But hey, what you can't win them all. Uh, if you missed any of these uh, previews, if you're a YouTube watcher, there is a playlist season previews. If you are a uh, audio listener, they're in your feed. Just search for them. Like I said, this is the sixth one we've done. Um there is a preview on Nazir Little's contributions, so uh, if you want to listen to that one. But for the most part, we've hit on folks who are actually going to be on the roster. Obviously, we delayed a little bit because there was there was going to be some of these shamrock shakeups coming. So let's let's talk uh, Robert Williams and Malcolm Brogdon. Uh, later in the episode, you're going to hear from John Corrales, host of Locked on Celtics, who's covered both of these gentlemen closely. Uh, Malcolm Brogdon for a season uh Robert Williams for several seasons. Uh, Krause is the best, so you will enjoy that one. Uh, we'll talk. We'll look backward, look forward first. We'll hear from Krause and then talk best worst case scenarios and expectations. But let us let us talk about last season for both of these gentlemen. Robert Williams appeared in 35 games. He started 20 of them. Played 23 and a half minutes a night. Averaged eight points, 8.3 boards, 1.4 assists, and 1.4 blocks. Shot 74.7 percent from the floor and 61 percent from the free throw line. He went 0 for 1 on threes. Misses only three point attempt. Poor fella. The story of Robert Williams' 2022 2023 season was just health. He missed the first 29 games. Um, and he had had a series of in, of surgeries on his left knee. He tore the meniscus in that knee, and that's in that left knee in March of 2022. He's having a monster season. He's been freaking great. They're heading into the playoffs as one of the best teams in the NBA. They're eventually going to make the NBA finals that year. Tears the meniscus in March. Has surgery, comes back about, about a month later and returned for the playoffs. Kind of missed spot starts here and there, or spot games here and there, and they run into the, into the through the first three rounds for the Eastern Conference playoffs because his knee was swelling. He's had some fluid fluid building up in there, but he played in the NBA Finals, but he was clearly not a hundred percent. And so the idea was during the NBA Finals that it wouldn't get it wouldn't be worse for him. Like he wasn't gonna there was there was no danger in returning. That was that was the reporting around then, but. It did seem like it wasn't great for him. Not a doctor, but I'm going to say from my perspective, it did seem like it wasn't great for him. And then in September, he had a second procedure on his left knee, and he was uh, going to be out for 8 to 12 weeks. Initially, he ended up getting PRP uh, injections to help improve that sort of knee and um, you know, his health in his knee in October. And then he finally returned in December of 2022. So it took him it took him more like 3 months from that september surgery to uh to get back and playing he but he mostly played after that mostly played after returning in, in december playing you know 23 24 minutes a night some spot some starts here and there he missed another 8 games in march with a hamstring uh injury and then he played every game during the uh celtics playoff run into the eastern conference finals but he was never truly himself. The dominant defender he had been a season ago, uh, Rob never got back there. Time Lord was never that. Malcolm Brogdon's season? Well, a sixth man of the year campaign. 67 games, every single one of them off the bench. Played 26 minutes a night, averaged 14 points, 4.2 boards, 3.7 assists. 
shot 48.4% from the floor, 44% from three, and 87% from the free throw line. Coming into this, this season, or coming into the last season, rather, Malcolm Brogdon was a career 37.6% three-point shooter. A good one, a good one. Um, you know, slightly above league average on some volume, good shooter. Shot 44% from three, including 45% above the break. Like, he was f- freaking great. Like, it was... He really, really, really shot the ball. 45% above the break, 43% from the corners. Like, consistent everywhere. But again, like, it wasn't like he was just, he was just, you know, parking in the corners and taking easy ones. He shot it really, really, really well. He he missed some games early with a hamstring issue and some games here and there with some ankle, an ankle injury and some Achilles soreness. But the injury stuff for Brogdon, and much the way it defined Williams' campaign, it defined Brogdon's campaign. He had a partially torn tendon in his right arm that didn't end his playoff run, but ended his playoff effectiveness. He sustained it in the second round, and then it just got worse, and eventually he had a, 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 you know, partially tore that tendon, and that just progressed as they headed into the Eastern Conference Finals, and his Eastern Conference Finals run ended with him really, really struggling, clearly not being healthy. And then Malcolm Brogdon was almost traded in the offseason. He's got two years, uh, you know, just over $20 million left on his contract. Super tradable and super good. He was really effective last year, like sixth man of the year, because he was scoring, he was, you know, 15-4-4 four, and four off the bench for one of the best teams in the NBA. But the Celtics, in pursuit of a shakeup, were going to deal Malcolm Brogdon to the Clippers in a multi-team trade that was going to bring Chris Tapps Porzingis to the Wizards. And I believe the initial reporting was that the Clippers basically got cold feet because of the elbow, forearm, right arm stuff with Brogdon. It was like, okay, his, he's, you know, still hasn't recovered. He's not going to have surgery. He's just going to, he's going to, you know, rest and take care of his body and try to come back and play. And we're, we're, you know, there were some nerves about it. And the idea was that the, Celt- the Clippers outright rejected the Malcolm Brogdon trade because of concerns over his injury. But it turns out that was probably not exactly the case. According to Jared Weiss, reporter for The Athletic, the it was more about timing. Uh, so the Chris Porzingis trade had to do, um, was, was sort of up against a deadline. He had a player option to pick up. And it was a midnight, uh, you know, midnight East Coast, 9 o'clock out here. I remember following it. Uh, 9 o'clock out here deadline um, to whether he was going to become a free agent and thus be very hard for teams like the, the Celtics to acquire because they they weren't going to have cap space or opt in and get traded. Opt in and get traded was probably uh, Porzingis's preference, right? But he was he 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 was not going to extend the deadline another 24 hours. Brogdon, while the Clippers had agreed to to uh, do the trade, were going to, he was going to fly to LA and do you know get his get the physical evaluation the next day, the medicals the next day in person with the Clippers. They didn't have until the next day. They didn't have another eight hours. Porzingis's clock said. Hey, Porzingis' you know, deadline made the clock an issue, is what I'm trying to say. And so because the Clippers couldn't get enough information and because the other parts of the deal weren't willing to wait on the Clippers, you know, getting the confirmation they needed, they just moved on. So it wasn't that they rejected him outright because of reviewing his medicals, it was because they weren't able to review his medical information. I think that is a very important distinction when you're thinking about him being back on the trade block here in the future. It's mostly about timing not about your but the body parts perhaps not being uh, a- able to play so both Robert Williams and Malcolm Brogdon land in Portland probably should have mentioned how they got here as part of the the second half of the Damian Lillard trade Damian Lillard gets traded to the Milwaukee Bucks and part of a three-team trade with the Phoenix Suns Drew Holiday Bucks point guard ends up to, heads to Portland in that deal and then less than three days later the Blazers decide to flip Holiday in a separate transaction to the Boston Celtics which netted the Blazers a couple first round picks and Brogdon and Williams Brogdon and Williams were not at media day. In fact, they're missing the first day of Blazers training camp as I am recording this. They are going to fly in to Santa Barbara to meet the team in Southern California on Tuesday evening and are expected to participate in Wednesday's uh, Wednesday's day two of training camp down with the team at UCSB. So... They're both, you know, Brogdon's going to report, I think there's some speculation and some reporting from Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN that Brogdon will, you know, the Blazers will explore options to trade Brogdon. I think that's certainly obviously true, but but at media day, um, Joe Cronin said that they wanted Brogdon to come in and be a part of the plan. 
What, whether that means for weeks or months, that will remain to be seen. But for now, Malcolm Brogdon's going to show up and be part of the Blazers. And the Blazers highly value Robert Williams for everything they've said publicly, and he'll be part of the team going forward. So let's talk about what we can expect, what they've been like. And to do that, I want to bring in in the second segment, John Corrales, the host of Locked on Celtics. You know, someone who covered these guys last season has covered Robert Williams for a handful of years and and can provide some real insight onto what they're like and what they'll bring to the Blazers. That's what we will do in the second segment. Before we do that, I want to tell you about comfortable pants. That's right. Just, just comfortable pants. Over the summer, I was rocking the bird dog shorts everywhere I went. So bird dogs doesn't just make shorts, though. They got their cloud knit fabric that also comes in joggers. Um, I'm, I'm rocking the comfortable joggers around the house because I work around the house. That's where I'm at. I'm in my home office, uh, perfectly comfortable in my bird dog joggers. But they're nice enough pants that you can wear them out for a variety of settings, not just lounging around the house and, and, and uh, you know, crunching numbers and spreadsheets, but you could dress them up and wear them out to a nice dinner. You could, uh, you know, wherever you need to go, you're going to be able to rock the bird dogs when you get there. And plus, they're super comfortable, not just versatile, but they just feel good. They look good. They, they make you look great. They got that slimmer fit that kind of um, so you don't look chunky and weird. You just look like you're wearing cool, comfortable pants. They're functional for any occasion. They feel good. What more could you want? Why not go to birddogs.com slash locked on NBA? Enter the promo code locked on NBA at checkout for a free bird dogs water bottle with your order. That's birddogs.com slash locked on NBA for a free bottle at water bottle at checkout. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. I promise you. All right. So what I want to talk about, what I want to do here in the second segment is I want to bring on John Krause, host of Locked on Celtics, to provide a little bit of insight into what both Robert Williams and Malcolm Brogdon are going to bring. Uh, the sort of view from Boston, the view from up close on contributors, the newest Portland Trailblazers. So let's just do that now. Joining me now the host of Locked On Celtics, and you've heard him on Locked On NBA, and you've read him all over the dang internet. John Corrales, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. How you doing? I'm doing wonderful. The Blazers, uh, well, they had media day on Monday, but they did not introduce two new faces from the Boston mm-hmm. Celtics because they are on the way. Uh, joining. They were joining the team late in Santa Barbara, Robert Williams and Malcolm Brogdon. So I didn't get to familiarize myself with them, but you very familiar. So I want to bring you in oh. and kind of chat with you about the Blazers, two new additions. We, let's just start here. Why were the, why were the Celtics willing to part with time Lord and Malcolm Brogdon? Uh, because Damian Lillard plays for the bucks now and they need to uh, account for that. And that's just, it's as simple as that. I think the new collective bargaining agreement has made it so Teams like Milwaukee, who are already expensive, Boston, who's already expensive, are doing what Phoenix did. Phoenix is all in. But you know what? Damn the torpedoes. This is the year. All of the second apron rules don't apply right now. So let's just kind of do all of the crazy expensive stuff like one last bender before the parents come home. So that's that's where they're at. And, and because Milwaukee was the team that – uh, got Damian Lillard, Boston was like, oh crap, now we got to do something. And, you know, if it was Miami that got Lillard, Boston probably wouldn't have felt the need to go get Tyler Hero, right? right. That, that's not how this would have gone. Uh, they, and I was at media day for the Celtics and, and Brad talked about like the really, really hard decisions. Marcus Smart and, and, and uh, Robert Williams were two extraordinarily popular guys in the locker room. And he moved both to get Porzingis and to now get Drew Holiday. So it's it's just a matter of these are the times, man. In this economy, you got to play by these rules. And, and Boston's just – people have been calling it ar- an arms race, and, and they're right. The Blazers created an artificial arms race by refusing to trade Damian Lillard to the Heat. Well, let me tell you uh, they, they, really, man, they played it really, really smart. This was as smart as you could play this trade – because you kind of forced Boston to give right. you assets. And and I don't know if that's what they thought was going to happen, but man, really, really smart by the Blazers. Yeah, I, I think the Drew Holiday thing was like, yeah, that's the tradable part we want. 
And because you get the Milwaukee in the fold, then you get your phone's going to ring. Your phone's going to ring from yeah. other good teams. Uh, and also because Drew Holiday has typically eaten Damian Lillard's lunch. So he's he's super appealing to teams that have to play Milwaukee in the playoffs. <laughs> That's right. Um, and four times and compete for the top seed. So like right. it's not just the playoffs. It's regular season two. Boston wants to make sure they have home court if it needs to go to a game seven and Dame time is is trying to to do it on the road versus at home. So regular season really, really matters. Those four games are going to be really important between these two teams. Yeah, it's um, it's it's what Adam Silver always dreamed of. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, I, Robert Williams, obviously, like, you know, he's been a high level contributor in the finals. What what can Blazer fans expect him to bring uh, on both sides of the ball? Yeah, he's I mean, he's going to be the guy that probably sticks around the longest. Um, right. And, and look, I, I enjoyed the hell out of the Robert Williams era. And I, I'm like a little sad. It just kind of hit me like, Oh, I'm talking about the end of the Robert Williams era. That sucks. Uh, first of all, just a genuinely good guy, right? Just, you're going to love talking to him. Uh, he, he tells it like it is. Uh, he's, he's a really good, like he's got nothing but the best of intentions in, in everything that he does. He's super unselfish. And on the offensive end, you're going to get your classic rim running kind of big, but also a guy that can play out of the high post and pass. And he, he spent the summer working on a jump shot that it's a, you know, not a three pointer, although he, the videos out there that he took some three pointers. Uh, it's, it's a mid range 15 footer that if a team is just playing way off of him, just make them pay. And if he can hit that consistently, and he has shown that he can hit it some, uh, he's a, he's a he's a good free throw shooter. So uh, I I think you could play him high pick and roll, dribble handoffs. You can play him in those spots, and he can he's a really good passer. Yeah, so he is. You, you can take advantage of his passing ability. If I'm on Portland, man, I'm cutting. I'm every I'm cutting as often as I can when he's got the ball. He will find backdoor cutters. So he's he's going to catch lobs. Obviously, he's he's a tremendous athlete. Um, he he that that spacing uh, is is really important, and he can catch in the short roll and hit that guy in the corner with the pass. So he's he's pretty good. And defensively, he's obviously a monster. When when Marcus yeah. Smart won the Defensive Player of the Year, a lot of people were saying, "Well, maybe that should have been Rob." Yeah. Uh, Rob makes all the perimeter guys better. He's, you can see guys turn the corner on a pick and roll and see Robert Williams and decide, you know what? I'm going to take this left. I'm going to hit out to the perimeter and then loop it back around and we'll start over. So he has that ability to affect uh, a defense and make it better. He's a plus player. And uh, I, I think his energy and his ability to, uh, to roam, you can, I heard some people talking about the fit with DeAndre Ayton. You can play those guys together because Aiton's allergic to the rim. He's he's not going to spend a whole lot of time in the restricted area, and Rob is cool in the restricted area. So they can kind of play off of each other, and Rob can kind of roam. You put him on the other team's worst offensive player, and he'll just get weak side block after weak side block. So he's I I love him. I'm I'm so sad that he's gone. I understand why, but I, I it's one of those things that Blazers fans, you for however long he's there, and I hope he's there for a while. You're gonna love him. He's awesome. Yeah, I, I do think during the regular season, Aiton and Williams is not a big deal. I think if you were playing the highest level basketball, like if you're playing in the in the finals or whatever, two bigs might be an issue. But I think in I think like November through March, it doesn't really matter. Like I think I think you can yeah. make it work. And yeah, as you I mean, mentioned, the, the, yeah. No, I was gonna say it just depends. It's just obviously those things depend on matchups. Right. Yeah. And the passing really helps. If 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 Robert Williams, if you're not getting guarded, but you can pass and set screens and and be that sort of Kavon Looney, Bam Adebayo, dribble handoff yeah. uh, aircraft carrier, where you're like, oh, you're not guarding me, ha ha, and then you set a quick yeah, yeah. screen, like you could make you could make it work. There's math to make it work. Okay, let's. Malcolm Brogdon might not be here for very long. He might not be in Portland for very long. Uh, I will say, Joe Cronin at Media Day did say that that Brogdon he wants to bring him in and have him be part of the plan, and he envisions him playing. And Chauncey Billups talks about how it's valuable to have a vet who can still play a vet. Malcolm Brogdon's 30 years old. He's the oldest player on the roster. Uh, but like he's he uh it's like to have someone who's you know 
played at a high level and can still play at a high level and say, here, here's how it works and yeah. teach some young guards how to play. What What is Brogdon going to bring to this team? I, I, I'm going to be honest with you, man. I don't think he wants that role. He he yeah. might play good soldier. He'll come in and be professional because he is an old, the ultimate pro, but that's not, that's not why he left Indiana. He left right. Indiana and, and chose Boston. They, they had, they presented him with, a couple of different palatable trades. They said, we we can do this trade with Toronto. We like it. We could do this trade with Boston. We like that. Which would you prefer? And he chose Boston because this was their chance to go win a championship. And that's what he wants. He didn't start a single game for Boston. He didn't even step in. I'm going in at this point last year, I was like, Malcolm Brogdon could win six man of the year if he doesn't start too many games because he might be out of the running. And they didn't start him once, not, not no matter what they always kept him on the bench. And, and so, yeah, he wins six man of the year. He was the good soldier. Obviously both of these guys are, are injury risks. We know that, but the, the unfortunate injury at the worst possible time for him, right? He, he wanted to, he wants to win a championship. He wants to win a championship. Will he come in and mentor? Sure. It, however long he's around Scoot Henderson, Scoot can lean on him and it's not like he's going to be like, get out of here, rookie. He'll, he'll give him whatever knowledge he can for however long it takes. But I, I would not be surprised if that is very short lived. I'm sure knowing how Portland has operated, they'll be on the phone with the Clippers and be like, Hey, you were into this before and you don't want James Harden, do you? So <laughs> let's, let's talk Turkey Let's get you the point guard that you're looking for. Let's all have a good hearty laugh at Daryl Morey. And then let's just watch, watch the mushroom cloud go up from, uh, you know, the Liberty Bell. But uh, Brogdon is, if, if for as long as he plays, you're going to have a guy, obviously, who drives, uh, somehow magically gets to the rim through spots where I'm not sure how he got there. Um, he's... He did kind of look off, I think, some open passes. So I think he is going to be looking for his own. Uh, he's If he is uh, playing for Portland, I think he's going to feel like he's auditioning and he's yeah. going to want to make sure that he's the good soldier. So he'll do he'll do all the right things and he'll say all the right things. Um, and, and he will be a – he's obviously still a high-level player um, and a guy who can shoot. He was, he was a really impressive shooter for Boston. Uh, so yeah, so that, that, that's what I think you can expect. And, uh, he won't be disruptive, but I also think he'll be honest. I think he'll be honest about, you know, I want this situation, um, and whatever, however he says it, he says it, but, um, yeah, I think, I think that's, what we're going to get. Yeah. I mean, I think that Blazers will trade him. I do not, th I don't even think like people saying like, wait till the trade deadline. I wouldn't be surprised if he's, I, if he's off the team before Thanksgiving, right? Like he might, yeah. I get it. I get the wait for the trade deadline. You know, whole, that that's what you do with like Robert Williams. If you want, right. if you, depending on how you, you want to move forward, I don't know what their plans are, but if you want to move Rob, that's a guy you wait till the trade deadline. Brogdon, that's get what you want because I think I think the Clippers. I'm almost. I'm just going to keep looking at the Clippers because they're the obvious trade partner, and right. they they had interest with Boston. They are the ones looking for somebody now, and I think I don't think waiting till the deadline is going to help. I think what you're going to do is they're going to move on. They're going to get somebody because they need somebody quickly, and you're going to lose a suitor. So I agreed a wholeheartedly with the slow play on Damian Lillard. It worked out for them. Very smart play. Very impressed by how they handled things. This one I don't think is a slow play situation, just like Holiday wasn't a slow play situation. This is move it quickly, get your assets, move forward. Don't even don't even have him come in and have to pretend. Let yeah. I don't even know if that would be as fair to to the guys who are there that are going to be part of the future. Don't even have that that facade. You just just move them and move on. Yeah, I think I Personally, yeah, that's I 100% agreed. I was surprised when they said to when they said at media day that was like, yeah, we want to be part of the plan. And I was like, 
well, the plan has to be to have him play for another team. But I hear you that like you got to say that now because he's because he's on the team. It's weird to be like Malcolm's going to show up and then we're by the end of the week, he will be a clipper and we'll have Marcus Morris or whatever it is. So. <laughs> right. right, right. <laughs> so it, I think it's just a timing thing. John, thank you so much for for uh, making this happen and then give us a little insight into the into the newest Blazers, even if one of them is a short timer. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Dear listeners, go listen to Lockdown Celtics. Um, John is an OG uh, solo podcaster. Nobody does a Lockdown solo show as well as John Corrales. So if you enjoy the musical stylings of Mike Richmond, you're going to love the Corrales experience. John, thanks so much, man. My pleasure, man. Happy to help out. Thanks again to John for joining the program. In the third segment, I want to talk about best and worst case scenarios for both Williams and and Brogdon. So that's what we'll do to close the show. Before we do that, I want to tell you about FanDuel. That's right. It's a great time to get involved with FanDuel because the NFL season is upon us and it's America's number one sports book. So they're giving new customers $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when he plays a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app's super easy to use. Uh, when you when you win, you can get your money with safe and fast withdrawals super, super quickly. And there's a wide range of betting options, including things like spreads, player props, over-under. So once you get those bonus bets for putting in your $5 bet, you get $200 to play around and bet on all types of stuff. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Kick off the NFL season. That's FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. All right. Still pass first point guard. Still Mike Richmond. You're still listening to Lockdown Blazers. I almost missed my my cue in the third segment here. But let's talk best and worst case scenarios uh, for Williams and Brogdon. Uh, what we do in these player previews is we look back to look forward. We talk about what they'll bring to the team. And then we try to set the best and worst case scenario. So these are, very importantly for these two gentlemen, within reason and without injury. So it's best case scenarios within reason. What's a reasonable best case scenario? And what is the worst case scenario without injury? We're talking about what happens between the lines. And like, let's just be totally up front here, as Corrales mentioned. Like, injury stuff is 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 part of these guys' history, part of, part of their history. I talked about it in the first segment as well. It's like, Injury concerns and the risks are there for both of these gentlemen. It's 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 just absolutely part of it. But that's not what we're talking about, best and worst case scenario. So let's get into it. What's the best case scenario for Robert Williams? Said he's an elite roamer and a defensive anchor getting back to his 2021-2022 self when he was one of the best defensive players in basketball. What I mean by elite roamer is if you've watched the uh, Celtics in high leverage games, uh, Rob, Rob is not typically, uh, he is sometimes, but when they're playing particularly in two big lineups or some other, or lineups where you don't have like a really imposing center, uh, and you can you know, stick Grant Williams on him or, or someone of that ilk, Jason Tatum, sometimes on, on bigger guys, even Marcus Smart, you can put Robert Williams on the worst defense, worst offensive player on the other team and let him just roam, let him just be a free range roamer. And then he can be that, that, uh, extra half defender in the paint. He can be every time a driver looks at the rim, they're worried because Robert Williams is roaming. He's not, you know, even when the Celtics played against say the Joel Embiid in the playoffs, it's like, that was a that was an Al Horford matchup, and and Rob got that Romer position to be a double team guy, to be a, to be a weak side threat, to be a shot blocker, and the best case scenario is he gets back to that, where he can be an absolutely disruptive force as a truly wonderful help defender. And the best case scenario is that his passing as a pick and roll outlet is the perfect complement to Scoot Henderson and Amphrey Simons, and that he's able to play real minutes next to DeAndre Ayton in monster big two big lineups. When the Celtics, during uh, during the 21-22 season, when they made the playoffs, or made the uh, NBA Finals, rather, that year, when they had lineups featuring Robert Williams and Al Horford together, they got 80% of the defensive rebounds. Elite on the glass. Two big lineups cleaned up misses. You did not get second shot opportunities. 80% of the, of the, of the defensive rebounds. A, a north of 80% defensive rebound rate. If... The best case scenario hits for Rob 
It's that he can play next to DeAndre Ayton and that his passing opens up Ayton's ability to, you know, space outside the paint. It's that he's a, he, you know, develops a, a little bit more touch because outside of five feet, he really doesn't have much op- offense right now, but he develops a little more touch. So teams have to be worried about him and that the two big lineups work even without the shooting of Al Horford that really balanced out and made it work for Boston. And if that best case scenario is true, the Blazers can play gigantic, not take a hit on the offensive end, be an elite rebounding team that's able to run. If you grab defensive rebounds, you know what you can do? You can run, which the Blazers want to do, and be be an elite defensive rebounding team and a really darn good defensive team because size matters on defense. And being able to play really big against most teams is going to make you a much better defensive team. Some teams obviously may be able to exploit it with, with the matchups, but... The best case scenario is that Rob can play next to DA and that you can play these monster lineups. The best case scenario for Malcolm Brogdon is that he has another elite shooting season and he continues his run as a 25 and 5 guy on a permanent basis like he's been for the last five years. You know, last season he played off the bench uh, and he didn't he didn't get his 36 minutes a night as a starter, right? But on a permanent basis, his per 36, he was still right there, 25 and 5 on his averages. He was 15, 4 and 4 last year because he just didn't play that much because he was a bent in a bench role. But he's been for five straight seasons, 25 and 5 on a per on a per minute basis. You're looking at his per 36 numbers. Best case scenario, he stays right there with another monster shooting season. And after a dominant per 36 run in Portland, he garners a decent first round pick in a trade in a trade sometime in the coming months or weeks. I do not think there's a best case scenario where Malcolm Brogdon is like the the answer at point guard. He's the oldest player on the roster. The Blazers are very much committed to Shaden Sharp and Scoot Henderson and Anthony Simons. And there's just not room for a fourth big minute guard. There's just there isn't a 30 minute a night role. And a 20 minute a night role is not probably ideal for, for Brogdon at this stage in his career. So the best case scenario for him is that he's a great short timer. He rocks that number 92 jersey and that in the coming weeks or the coming months, another team says we would love to have him on the roster and he gets flipped and the for what's next as they continue to to move players around and the Blazers end up with a juicy first round pick and whatever the salary is to match or if it's trading with a contender type maybe some maybe multiple picks I don't think you're getting multiple firsts for Malcolm Brogdon but the best case scenario is an appealing first round pick and the salary to match that isn't super onerous let's flip to the other side what's the worst case scenario for Rob, for Rob Williams is that his offensive limitations means he can't play next to DeAndre Ayton and that leads to frustration over his fit because he's only a backup center with this new era and that his fit and future with the franchise come into question. Um, I don't, I don't really have questions assuming he's healthy in these, in these best and worst case scenario things about his defense. I think he's going to be a good defensive player regardless. So it's really about if he can fit into the plan. And if he's only, uh, if he can't play next to DeAndre Ayton, he has a limited role, right? Cause Ayton is going to play 30 some minutes a night. And then his, max he's maxing out in that 23 24 range if he's comfortable with that not a problem but if he says hey i'm a starter i'm you know i'm i'm 25 i can be really i can be really good i don't want to have this limited role then his his there can be frustration with fit and then there's a frustration about your future and he becomes a guy who the blazers basically have to move on from because he doesn't because he's too good to be a backup essentially the worst case scenario for Malcolm Brogdon is where he was once comfortable as a backup in Boston. He just doesn't accept a 20-minute bench role as a mentor on a young team that's not nearly as good. And he ends up leaving in a trade for spare parts because his shooting regresses a little bit from an absolutely monster career year little last year and the vibes are a little bit off. Shooting drops down like, is he going to shoot 44% from three again on some volume? I don't know, but if he but if he if he regresses back to his career average, like right around thirty seven percent, that's a pretty big drop off from a season ago. It might be a very believable drop off, but the worst case scenario is that there's a drop off in the shooting, and coupled with frustrations over his role, again the Blazers aren't committed to a young core. He's he's it's not like he. I do not believe Malcolm Brogdon has an opportunity to start. And I don't believe he has an opportunity to play 35 minutes a night. And on a team where he's, where sacrificing is not reaching a Larry O'Brien, but sacrificing is reaching like meaningful developmental minutes for a teenage cornerstone in, in Scoot Henderson, there could be some frustrations there. And then the dream of a permanent monster for Brogdon might drop off a little bit. And with bad vibes and a little bit worse production, the Blazers will, le- will lead to the Blazers swapping him for a couple second rounders and Sal 
recovery. The worst case scenario is that Brogdon is again a short timer, but he doesn't return nearly as much because of those issues. Uh, realistically, like I like to talk roles and expectations in this in this section as well as we wrap up here. I think both these guys are bench guys. Uh, I think. Um, while there's been some speculation that the Blazers will start two bigs, I do not think they will. I think Jeremy Grant will start at power forward. I think we'll see some two big lineups with Robert Williams playing next to DA, but I do not think he will start as the power forward next to DeAndre Ayton. I, I think that is, um, I think that's something they'll experiment with, not something they'll rely on necessarily. I think that's just, just the most reasonable expectation. And Brogdon is probably a bench guy. Uh, you know, they'll have to figure it out, right? Like uh, at at media day, Billups was very coy about talking about roles and minutes and all that stuff in part because uh robert williams and malcolm brogdon hadn't shown up yet and he didn't want to talk about here's what you're going to do before even meeting with them but i can't imagine that that brogdon gets prioritized to start both of these guys are bench guys this is your sixth and your seventh man however you want to slice it um these are part of the blazers intriguing top eight along with shade and sharp as a bench part joining starters scoot henderson anthony simons matisse Thybul, and jeremy grant along with deandre Ayton. uh i that's my guess, right? This is that's your top eight. I, I it, I'm correct about it being your top, their top eight. Not maybe not about who starts and and all that. But both these guys are bench guys. I think they max out playing about half the game at like absolute max out roles, like somewhere in the 24 minute mark. Uh, both are. Robert Williams has a chance to be very, 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 very helpful and potentially, potentially extremely tradable at the de deadline. And Brogdon is just destined to be traded at some point in the near future. And it really depends on what he garners back in return because the Blazers, again, for the millionth time, have guards that they're committed to for the long term. And, and Brogdon just isn't part of that plan. Okay. That is going to do it for today's show. Come back for Friday. You are listening to uh, to Thursday, October 5th show. Come back for Friday show when we will discuss the first week of training camp, what we learned, and what we're looking ahead to in, in the final days uh, leading up to the Blazers preseason games. I appreciate you listening. Oh, tell your friends about the show. I always say that here at the end, and I really do mean it. Tell your friends about the show. It's super helpful. Tell your friends. I appreciate you listening. I'll talk to you soon.